His name is Andy Mock. He's the re Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. So Andy, welcome to the show. Great to be with you tonight, Jingjing. Uh, so, you know, like I mentioned, uh, China's economy is probably the most asked questions. Like, China, how is China's economy? Is it good or bad? It's probably the most frequently discussed and asked questions by people outside of China, particularly from the people uh, in the business circle uh, in the West. So, it, but you know, earlier this month, on December the 11th to 12th, uh, China's annual uh, Central Economic Worker Conference uh, took place in China. And I think if you read the full readout, comprehensive readout, I think the, it conveyed a quite a clear message that economic growth is the top priority for China. So do you agree with this? And what's your takeaway from China's Economic World Conference? Well, thanks for having me on, Jingjing. So first of all, um, as someone who's been trained in economics and has worked as an investor, worked in finance, uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, people that watch and listen to your show are interested in economics. So you may know, uh, people watching right now may know that economics is called the dismal science because it is so boring. So I'm happy to hear that there are people interested in this. Let me start uh, by uh, putting some context uh, around this year's uh, Central Economic Work Conference report. So 45 years ago, in 1978, uh, which may sound like a very, very long time ago, um, but it's really only uh, not even one human lifetime, the many, many people in China uh, were far less well off than, they're today, than they are today. Most people aspired this was their aspiration, their dream. And you're far too young to, to maybe remember this and, and know this. Um, but their dream was to own a bicycle and a wristwatch. So uh, the people that are listening in the West, you know, may not completely appreciate this, but I know there are people uh, listening and watching in Africa, in parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia, for this, this is their reality. And in 45 years, China's economy, the country as a whole, would be completely unrecognizable because of the prosperity. And I have a good friend uh, at Tsinghua University who joked that uh, she's about my age, uh, said that when she was eight, she worried about getting enough to eat. When she was 18, she had to worry about losing weight. And I think this just shows <laughs> Uh, the tremendous economic progress uh, that would not have been possible without sound political leadership. Uh, so this is just uh, you know a bit of context with where we are today. And why does this matter? Because uh, this Central Economic Work Conference report comes at a time when China uh, has faced, like many places in the world, has faced some very, very challenging economic times, uh, partly due to COVID partly due to geopolitical tensions, including those with the United States, but also the conflict in Ukraine, also the conflict uh, in West Asia uh, between Israel and, and Hamas uh, that may unfortunately spiral into a larger conflict, uh, that these are very, very uncertain times. So business people, investors, uh, even individuals who might be managing their personal investments, of course, care about the outlook for China's economy. So my takeaway from this is that uh, it's a confirmation and a validation that the political decisions, the economic decisions uh, that have been made uh, are largely correct. So there are no major changes necessary. And again, I think this shows the strength of the Chinese system in that politically, there is continuity and there is predictability. And for business people and investors, predictability and consistency are so important. So I think this is one message. The second message is that the one of the most important statements uh, was that we must adhere to high quality development. This is the hard truth of the new era. 
And like many Chinese political statements, we have to unpack it to really understand the complete implications. So first of all, while I think it's uh, no one, even the uh, most negative China hawk can dispute uh, China's economic miracle since economic reform. Um, there's a lot of questions, skepticism, doubt. Some of it is in good faith. I think some of it is malicious uh, about the outlook for the Chinese economy. Um, but my view is that this is indeed a challenging, perhaps even pivotal time. And this statement uh, that adhering to high quality development is the hard truth of the new era uh, properly acknowledges that. So, um, you know, as a business person or as a, as a former business person, um, I read a lot of business books. And one of my favorite business books, because of the title, uh, was is called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, How Successful People Become Even More Successful. And I think this captures the essence of the challenge facing China's economy today, in that the things that allowed it to be so successful in the past no longer will serve it going forward. So a large, low-cost uh, labor force, attracting foreign investment and foreign technology, investing in infrastructure. So these uh, policy initiatives have, again, transformed uh, the lives of 1.4 billion Chinese people, I think in ways that no one could have imagined how well this would have tur this turned out. But at the same time, now I think the government recognizes that high quality development must be the priority. And this means uh, that not only is economic growth important, which you said, but the kind of growth matters. So it cannot be growth for growth's sake. Um, again, because of demographic changes, because the world has changed, because China has advanced so much technologically, uh, that the new drivers of growth uh, have to be found. And this lies in a couple things. So uh, advancing the technology, uh, the level of technology, because China's advanced so much that there isn't too many technologies that it can copy from somewhere else. Somewhere else, It has to advance on its own through R&D, through commercialization. Uh, the world has changed in that uh, the markets that uh, allowed China's economic growth in the past have, have become a little bit different, so they require new approaches. Uh, the world has become more complex, which means national security has to be woven into economic policy uh, making as well. And lastly, the world recognizes the impact, the economic impact of economic growth. So China also has taken the lead here, uh, not only domestically, but globally in uh, forums like the UN, other forums as well. Uh, that sustainable, environmentally sustainable economic growth is very important as well. So this is a challenge. It's also an opportunity. And I think that uh, this might be a bitter pill for some people to swallow, but these are the hard truths. So change uh, produces winners. It also produces some difficulties as well. And we are in this period uh, that I think the government rightly recognizes as difficult. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think the government is optimistic. And as someone who follows these issues very closely, I think its optimism is not unwarranted. The story you mentioned that the Chinese girl your age told you that when she was young, she was uh, worried about not having enough food to eat, and then when she's at this age, you worry about like losing weight. I mean, that's I so related to that story. Let me just share your. Uh, I'm in my 30s, so uh, when I was a kid in my family, a very ordinary family, we didn't have flushing toilets. So flushing toilets, yes. when I was a kid, several, several years old, uh, flushing toilets was something fancy to have. 
And、uh, when I was a kid, so little, one or two years old, I remember、uh, all my family members told me I was a kid that's malnourished because they didn't have enough protein to feed me. So I didn't have enough、uh, <laughs> calcium to grow bones. So my bones were、uh, soft, and that's why I was short. I'm still short. I probably because of not <laughs> having enough nutrition when I was a kid. But now this age, when I'm in my thirties, I'm worrying about having too much nutrition, having too much food. I always worry, how can I lose weight? So this is the change within my lifetime, and I'm the young generations in the eighties, born in the eighties. So this is shows my story is probably just one small example of the dramatic changes of 1.4 billion people in China. So I totally <laughs> resonate with that story. But no, Jingjing. Jing, you know, this is why. Sorry, just to briefly、yeah. interject here. But this is why it is so important、uh, to share these stories, especially with people in the so-called West, because you know, if you've spent time in the United States or Western Europe, you know, people for generations have lived with you know what we think of as modern conveniences, grocery stores full of food. Hot running water, twenty four hours a day, right? So that actually is a thing. That before in China,、uh, you didn't. Not everywhere had hot water all day, right? So even these things that people in the, in the West would take for granted and probably can't imagine living without, many people in China are so grateful for the changes that again. You know, I, I have an economics background, but I also focus on politics, and these subjects are inseparable. Without、uh, competent, committed political leadership, this would not be possible. And yeah, I think this is again, it's it's can be a controversial subject in certain parts of the world, but this is the truth, and this is the reality on the ground in China, which is, you know, which may puzzle some、uh, Westerners who have been indoctrinated with certain beliefs. How can the Chinese people support? You know, a government that isn't this, this, and that. Well, it's because they've seen the enormous positive changes in their lives, and yeah, I think this is one of the gaps that、uh, exists between China and the West. But it's also, I think, why so many in the global South have such a positive view of China because they, this is their lives as well, and I think they see China today as their future. Yeah, and uh, uh, my next question for you is because of I mean we talk about China's economy and we look at the positive side of it, but you know if you look at the international media coverage,、uh, even though China's economy has been the most discussed question, but the attitude, the tones are quite pessimistic.、Um, they worry about China's、uh, real estate problems. And worry about what China is still the ideal market for foreign investment.、Um, so I mean, all this.、Uh, I mean,、uh, all these worries. Of course, we do, we are facing some challenges, as you mentioned、uh, previously. But do you agree with this pessimism、um, from the international media, particularly Western media, and、uh, what they got right and what they got wrong about China's economy? Yeah, that's another great question, Xinjing. So I think, first of all, with any complex phenomenon, so、uh, the economy in China, any major country's economy, is complex. There's、uh, contradictory, ambiguous information. So I think it's perfectly natural that people arrive at perhaps very different, even opposing views. And of course, we see this. Most clearly in the stock market, any stock market, right? This is why we have people that buy and people that sell at the same time. So I think this is not surprising. But at the same time, I think that、uh, there are people who are,、uh, in my view, get it wrong in good faith. They may not consider all of the information. They may honestly misinterpret. The information, but I think there's also another sizable group that、uh, deliberately set out to portray China in the most negative light possible, and I think that they do this for various reasons. 
So some, I think they uh, have a political alignment with certain countries uh, that see China as an adversary. I think others do this out of a almost subconscious reflex in that they've been indoctrinated or perhaps we could even say brainwashed uh, that uh, China is bad because it's a communist system. And that kicks in a kind of an amygdala response and emotional hijacking that we still see, you know, surprisingly in places like the U.S., that what ends a conversation about China is, well, they're communist, okay? And that just means they're bad. <laughs> and, and, you know, thoughtful people uh, are, are dig a little bit deeper, right? So, so I think this is a lot of what is driving this. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that uh, for these people, in a way, talk is cheap, right? So there are no consequences to them writing negative stories about China. When you look at the people that uh, where their views matter, so investors, uh, business people, they generally are far more positive about China. And you look at uh, also because they have actually experienced making money here, whether you're a Fortune 500 corporation, whether you're a financial investor, uh, you know, many uh, you know, they're certainly uh, recognize the challenges that China faces. And here, I think it's important to point out the perspective of foreign business people and foreign investors. Uh, certainly, there's less optimism than it was 20 years ago. And why is that? So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Chinese domestic companies were far less competitive. Chinese consumers were far less discriminating. That more or less, if you showed up, you probably were able to make money. Today, we see companies like Huawei. We see companies uh, like BYD. Uh, we see a host of other companies. We see companies like Luckin Coffee, right? These are all formidable domestic players and also formidable, some of them, formidable global players. So it's much more difficult for a foreign company to make money in China today because it's gotten much more competitive. Um, while incomes have risen in China, which is good for business, there's more money that people can spend. Um, but at the same time, there are many people like you that travel around the world, have been exposed to the best in class, whether this is uh, fashion, whether this is dining, uh, you know, whether it's sporting equipment, um, and they're discriminating. So the Chinese consumer is much harder to win over. So this is difficult. But at the same time, um, the rationale for being in China for many foreign businesses have shifted as well, because now it's not only about the China market, which, of course, is growing, but also more competitive, uh, but it's also because so much innovation is happening in China today. So you may remember, or you may not remember, but once upon a time, people said that Chinese companies cannot innovate, first of all. Second, they said that China could never have a successful commercial product in the West, because even if they could close the technology gap, there's no way the Chinese can understand and hear the implicit I think uh, meaning here was that they could not be as, as sophistic, sophisticated enough to understand American cultural expectations and uh, desires. And yet look at what happened with TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this means that for many uh, foreign businesses, whether you're a German automaker, uh, even whether you're an athletic wear, an American athletic wear company, you have to be in China, not just for the market, but to see what's going on so you can remain globally competitive. So um, it's, it's, a, it's much more nuanced than it was 20 years ago for foreign businesses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, a joke that we poke fun at ourselves many years ago. 
So uh, it's a Chinese way, 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 way. Sometimes we say, you know, here, uh, stupid people, lots of money, come fast. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> we joke about that yes. because basically any business, any company, uh, you come here, you immediately make a lot of fortune because people will, like I like, like mentioned, uh, indiscriminately buy your stuff. But now as domestic brands, domestic technologies are so become so advanced and uh, competitive, now it's challenging for foreign companies, like you need to design better products, better technologies to compete with these Chinese companies. So I think it's, it's eventually it's good for, for all these industries because competitions make progress. So very interesting uh, perspective. Thank you, Andy. But uh, my last question for you is, I also have some comments uh, from viewers on different platforms. Uh, I can show those to you and see how you see that. So let's take like, the first comment. Oh, so this is a comment uh, left on my vlog about the China's import and export uh, fair in, in Guangdong. Uh, so this viewer said, uh, China invests in developing countries such as BRI, and more Chinese companies are setting up production lines locally, offering jobs and create prosperity. When local people are richer, they can do more trade with China. It is a win-win cooperation from a long-term economy, strategic perspective. This is from YouTube. Let's take a look at the next one. Oh, so this is the interview. At this is the interview I did uh, just in October in San Francisco. So I interviewed this uh, American scientist, John Walsh, and he said if America blocks China's tech companies, it probably will hurt uh, American tech companies more than hurting Chinese companies. And actually a lot of viewers left their comments on TikTok. Uh, for example, this person said China is doing amazing scientific work. Uh, this year they now hold the record for longest nuclear fusion. Artificial Sun, amazing work in space too. And last year, China completed their space station Tiangong mission in Mars and the moons. China achieved many engineering feats with the world's biggest hydro dams. China has most high-speed rail in the world. China made the first ever operational thorium energy reactor better and safer than nuclear energy. China built the largest highway network in the world, largest quantum communication network, largest radio telescope dish. And China builds more skyscrapers in the world. They have brilliant engineers that create many innovative machines and techniques, build mega projects. I don't know who this viewer is, but uh, clearly this Ooh. person knows a lot about Chinese technology. Very knowledgeable. <laughs> yes. Very knowledgeable. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, do you? How do you take this uh, comments from viewers? Do you think they are uh, making a, a fair point? <laughs> I do. So, you know, again, Jingjing, if we look at this from a more historical perspective, and I used to work in venture capital and private equity. Uh, looking for making investments in Chinese technology startups. Um, it's rational. So when China was uh, poor and undeveloped, it actually was not, it would not be very smart to invest a lot in R&D because you're much better off just importing licensing technology into China, right? Because in business, there's different kinds of risk. There's market risk. Do the customers want what you're selling? there's execution risk. Can you actually run the business in a way that would be profitable? And then there's technology risk. If the product doesn't exist, can you actually build it? So even if people are willing to pay for it, you have the distribution retail channels to sell it. But if you actually can't build the thing, uh, you're, you're gonna have a failed business. So business is all about reducing risk. So it made sense to do that. At the same time, from, the beginning of reform and opening, Deng Xiaoping talked about, you know, the four modernizations and science and technology was one of them. Uh, and again, this is where political leadership in terms of consistency and predictability is so important that this has been uh, a common theme and priority for 45 years, which is why we see so many of these achievements. And I think we can expect to see many, many more uh, in the years ahead. And, you know, I know we all are probably paying attention to semiconductors uh, as one very important field. And China's making 
uh, some important breakthroughs. It's not only SMIC, but when we look at places like Tsinghua uh, doing research into new models uh, where we think of lithography, right? So with a chip, you have to actually etch the pattern onto a chip. There's a company in the Netherlands called ASML that has the most advanced uh, technology uh, to do this, but these look like uh, tractor trailers, right? And, and they have to be shipped. So uh, China at Tsinghua is developing a model that uh, is enormous. It's like several football fields, right? Um, it's a completely new way of conceptualizing and thinking about lithography. And, you know, I can it's a double-edged sword that uh, uh, the U.S. has imposed these sanctions that has hurt Huawei, but Huawei showed tremendous resilience and is, you know, back stronger than ever. I think this will be exactly what happens with China, but it will hurt the U.S.'s long-term technological competitiveness, as which I think is your your uh, your your, your uh, the person that posted alluded to. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andy. Very enjoying that you are on my show sharing this perspective on China's economy. My pleasure. <laughs> it's the first time you are on my show. I do hope you come back to my show more often. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, Andy. And everybody hit that like button. <laughs> yes, smash that like button. <laughs> Let <laughs> more people hear Andy's perspective, Absolutely. China's analysis on China's economy. Thank you so much, Andy. See you next time. Thank you, Jingjing. Jing. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.